In this video, we'll consider possible implementations for the network layer. In the process of examining the different implementations, we'll also get to know a few new terms. As we've said in the previous videos, the third layer allows transferring packets over multiple hops. How can that be achieved? Well, one way would be a physical circuit. Let's say we have two computers and a few routers. Now, Computer A wants to send a packet to computer B. In a physical circuit network, we have to physically establish a connection between A and B. So, for example, we would have to connect computer A and router 1 via a cable, then router 1 and router 3 via a cable, then router 3 and router 4 via a cable, and lastly set up a cable between router 4 and computer B. Now, we have a connection established and computer A can send messages to computer B. Note that in this state, the route is known for all packets. When A sends a packet to B, router 1 knows that it should forward this packet to router 3, as the connection is physically established. Any message coming from this port connected to computer A will be forwarded to this port connected to router 3. No question about it. Each router can handle multiple connections, of course, but each connection will be handled over different physical cables. For example, router 1 may have one connection established from computer A to computer B via router 3, and another connection from computer C to computer B via router 2. There will be no difficulty in distinguishing these connections. When router 1 receives a packet from this port here, he knows that it belongs to the connection from computer A to computer B, as this port is allocated specifically for this connection. Actually, it doesn't need to know it's the connection between computer A and computer B, it just knows that this connection relates to this port, and thus the packet will be forwarded to this port and not another one. Well, what are some advantages and disadvantages of this model? One good thing is that it's very, very easy for routers. Once the connection is established, the router's job is very simple. Just forward the packet, and no real thinking is required. In addition, note that the packets don't contain additional redundant information here. The routers know what to do with each packet without any extra data. In other words, without any overhead. We've talked about the term overhead already in video 3.3, so if you need a reminder, please watch that video. The order of packets is also guaranteed. Let's say computer A wants to send two packets to computer B. If we send packet number one over the established connection, and then send packet number two, then packet one will be received at the end before packet number two. This is guaranteed as all packets are transferred via the same route. Therefore, computer B does not need to bother itself with the packet order. The first packet received is the first packet sent. It is also very easy to maintain quality of service in this model. What do we mean by that? Well, quality of service is the description or measurement of the overall performance of the network. For example, consider a mobile phone's network where users experience lots of delays. That is, one person says something and it takes a lot of time till the person at the other end gets to hear it. Such delays may occur for many reasons. One reason is that a channel between routers is jammed, that is, has lots of traffic going through it. If the users experience long delays when they speak, this means a low quality of service. Notice that every link has bandwidth, that is, the maximum rate of data that can be transferred on the link. For instance, let's say that this link here can handle 1000 bits per second. If we try to send 1500 bits, then 500 bits are liable to be dropped. Of course, dropping some of the data means a low quality of service. In addition, if the session hangs up often, this is obviously low quality of service. As I've said earlier, in a physical circuit network, it is easy to ensure high quality of service. If I establish a connection between A and B, the physical connection is allocated for A and B only. There is fixed bandwidth allocated only for that connection, so there is no risk of dropping packets due to congestion caused by communication by other machines. If there are not enough physical links to set up a new connection, we'll simply not establish this new connection. But if a connection has been established, all the necessary resources are allocated for it. Yet, 
not everything is perfect. Clearly, this kind of network is very expensive. We have to set up a physical link between devices for every single connection. That costs lots of money and also, well, lots of time for our IT guy. And as we've said in the past, we love our IT guys. Just think about that poor guy running around between these routers and stretching these cables between them. This implementation also comes with a time overhead. It takes time to establish every connection, time that we have to wait before sending our first packet. Also, what happens if a router is damaged? The entire connection will be lost and we'll have to set up the connection again, that is, pay the overhead once more. There is a lot of redundancy in this model, since the entire bandwidth of a link is allocated for a single connection. Let's say that A and B want to communicate, and we thus allocate a link between routers 1 and 3. This cable can handle 3000 bits per second. Now, neither A nor B have anything to send, so this cable's bandwidth is completely wasted, as it cannot be used for other connections. Okay, I think we've talked enough about physical circuit networks. Now, let us consider an alternative model. Virtual circuit. In virtual circuit networks, we also have to establish a connection prior to sending data. But, this time, establishing a connection is done virtually rather than physically. So, let's consider our network diagram again. Cables are already connecting all the devices and we don't need to touch them. Now, computer A wants to send a message to computer B, so a new connection must be established. This connection is virtually created and assigned a circuit identifier, for example, 7. So now, router 1 knows that if it receives a packet which belongs to circuit 7, it has to pass it to router 3. Router 3 knows that if it receives a packet from circuit 7, it passes it on to router 4, and so on. So the route does not change for each packet, and is determined for the entire session, just like in physical circuit networks. For virtual circuits to work, we need a couple of things. First, the routers need to store a table, telling them which circuit identifier goes to which router or to which port. So in our example, router 1 stores that if it receives a message that belongs to circuit 7, it forwards it on to router 3. Router 3 has an entry saying that messages that belong to circuit 7 need to be forwarded to router 4, and so on. Of course, router 3 doesn't know it's router 4, rather it knows which port this packet should be forwarded to. Of course, multiple circuits may coexist, so the routers will store additional entries. Let's say we have computer C, which also has a connection with computer B. If this connection goes through routers 2 and 4, then the following entries will be added to their tables. So, the routers have tables, but when they receive a packet, how do they know what circuit this packet belongs to? For that, each packet has to carry a short circuit ID, so the packet sent from computer A to router 1 has to state that it belongs to circuit 7. Then the router looks at its table for this circuit ID, finds the relevant entry, and forwards the packet to router 3 accordingly. This is actually a simplified version of virtual circuit networks. We haven't elaborated much about the process of initiating a new connection in virtual circuit networks, as our focus here is to understand its pros and cons, especially in comparison to other implementations. Since this is a practical course, in future videos we'll focus on the implementation that is mostly used on the internet. If you're interested in more information about virtual circuit networks, follow the links I've provided in the description below. Well, what do you think about this model? What's good about it? What's not so good? One obvious advantage over physical circuit networks is the cost. We can reuse the same physical cable for multiple connections. For example, the link here can be used to transfer data both from computer A to computer B and from computer C to computer B. There will be no problem in distinguishing these two connections as they will carry different identifiers. It is still quite easy to maintain quality of service here. Let's say that router 3 can handle at max three connections at a time. Once this router already has three active connections to handle, the network can refrain from establishing new connections that pass via router 3. So, similar to physical circuits, the network either sets up a new connection and allocates the required resources for it, or doesn't set up the new connection at all. In general, routers in a virtual circuit network have simple lives. 
when a packet arrives, the routers don't have to think much. They just look into their tables and forward the packets accordingly. Furthermore, just like in physical circuit networks, the order of arrival is guaranteed, since the route does not change from one packet to another. If computer A sends two packets to computer B, it is guaranteed that packet 1 will arrive at B before packet number 2. On the other hand, we still have to pay the overhead of establishing a new connection before sending packets. Moreover, if a single router goes down, we have to establish a new connection and pay that overhead once more. We also have additional overhead here that we didn't have in physical circuit networks. The circuit ID that each packet carries, and it is additional data sent over the network, is considered overhead. This wasn't necessary when dealing with physical circuits, as the routers could tell that any packet received from a specific physical port belongs to a specific route, that is, a specific connection. Note that this implementation is not flexible. Once a connection has been established, all packets will be sent on this route during this connection's lifetime. Consider a case where computer A wants to establish a connection with computer B. By the time of establishing the connection, router 3 had a line with router 5 that wasn't used for any other connection, so it was chosen for establishing the connection. Yet, after a few minutes, other connections have been established, and now router 5 is under a lot of stress. It might have been better to send all the packets from router 3 to router 4 instead of router 5, yet it is not possible, as the connection has already been established. I hope that you remember that when we first presented the third layer, we compared it to the navigation app Google Maps. When we use Google Maps and specify our destination, we have a route that we're supposed to drive through, but this route may change. If a car accident on a certain road causes a major traffic jam, Google Maps can change its mind and tell us to take another way. This is not possible in virtual circuit networks, since they are connection-based. As a matter of fact, both of the implementations we have covered so far, physical circuits and virtual circuits, are connection-based or connection-oriented implementations. These terms have equal meanings. In connection-based or connection-oriented implementations, the endpoints have to first establish a connection and only then can they transfer data. This is just like a phone call. You can't just pick up your phone and start talking to me. Well, I guess you could, but then I wouldn't hear what you said. If you want me to listen to you talking, then you should dial my number, wait for me to pick up, and only then, when the connection is established, is the time for you to talk and convey your message. So connection-based implementations require establishing a connection prior to sending data. In the network layer, this means that a path from the source all the way to the destination is established before any packets are sent. On the contrary, Connection-less implementations do not require any setup prior to sending data. In a connectionless service, packets are injected into the network individually and routed independently of each other. You can think of sending text messages as a connectionless service. If you send me a text message, you don't have to establish a connection first. You're not going to dial and wait for me to pick up before sending the message, but rather you simply send your text message without setting up a connection. A connectionless implementation of the network layer is a packet switch network. In such networks, no connection is established. If computer A wants to send a message to computer B, then it simply sends this message. Now, let's say that the message will travel to router 1, which chooses to forward it to router 2. Router 2 now forwards this message to router 4, which eventually forwards it to computer B. Next, computer A wants to send another message to computer B. So, computer A delivers the message to router 1. Now, router 2 is really busy due to lots of other traffic it has to handle. Therefore, the link between router 1 and router 2 is jammed. Router 1 thus decides to send this message via router 3, which forwards it to router 4. And then, eventually, router 4 forwards the message to computer B. So, every router makes routing decisions for every packet, rather than every connection. In this example, I've described the extreme case where the routers actually consider every single packet on its own. In real life, it's not really the case, but just to make things clear, let's say it can happen even for every single packet. Well, what do you think about this implementation? Is it better or worse than the ones we've seen before? There is definitely less overhead for setting up a connection. 
Actually, we have no overhead for s establishing a connection, since we don't establish a connection at all. If A wants to send a packet to B, then A simply sends it. No additional preparation is required. Furthermore, if a router goes down, we don't have to establish a new connection. For example, let's say that A sends a message to B via this route. Now, router 3 is no longer active for some reason, so when A sends another message to B, router 1 will forward it via router 2 instead of router 3. Since the route is not fixed, the network can easily deal with a single router's failure. This model is also highly flexible. It is perfectly possible to send one message from A to B via this route, and I'll send another message from A to B via this route. This better resembles Google Maps, which can change its mind about the route while driving. So, is everything perfect? Like many things in life, different implementations have pros and cons, and so does this one. This model is much more complicated for routers. Let's say that router 1 receives a message destined for B. In a physical circuit model, router 1 would just need to forward it based on the physical source port. In a virtual circuit, router 1 would forward it based on its router ID, or the circuit ID. But now, Router 1 only knows the destination address, B's address, and needs to figure out the best way to send this packet. Additionally, what information does a packet have to carry in a packet switch network? Well, let's remind ourselves that in a physical circuit network, there was no need for any information, as the route was based on the physical port in which the packet arrived. In a virtual circuit network, each packet included a short circuit ID. What happens now, when we don't have circuits and thus no circuit IDs? Well, each packet has to carry the full destination address. If A sends a message to B, then this message has to say, my destination is B. This means more overhead for each packet compared to the previous models we've considered. In addition, it's harder to maintain quality of service in this model. In connection-based implementations, if we wanted to ensure that A and B will be able to communicate without packet loss, we'd allocate a connection for them and allocate all required resources, such as bandwidth, for that connection. In a packet switch network, we don't have connections, so this method is quite irrelevant. As we've seen, each implementation has advantages and disadvantages. Which one do you think best fits the internet? Well, at least for the most part, we use a connectionless model on the internet. Specifically, the IP protocol is a connectionless protocol. We'll elaborate on this protocol in upcoming videos. The reason for that is that the internet is a very dynamic environment. Things change all the time, and thus routes should change too. A truck that drives over a cable in Russia might cause a link between two routers to fall, and we wouldn't want that to cause lots of connections to fail. In such a dynamic environment, we prefer the flexibility of connectionless networks and are willing to pay the price of its disadvantages. So, in this video we considered three possible implementations for the network layer. We talked about physical circuit networks, where connections are physically established. When a router receives a packet, the router knows how to forward it based on the physical port that it was received from. We then considered virtual circuit networks, where connections are virtually established on top of the physical infrastructure. When a router receives a packet in such networks, it uses the circuit ID on the packet to know which circuit it belongs to, and then forwards the message accordingly. These two implementations are connection-based, or connection-oriented implementations. That is, a connection is established prior to sending data. Lastly, we talked about packet switch networks, a connectionless implementation where packets are sent without establishing a connection. The route decisions can be made on a per packet basis, which allows greater flexibility. We also introduced the term quality of service, that is the description or measurement of the overall performance of the network. We said that it's harder to maintain quality of service in connectionless implementations than it is in connection-based implementations. We also mentioned the term bandwidth, that is, the maximum rate of data that can be transferred on the link. By now, we're already familiar with lots of terms related to computer networks. Okay, that is enough for this video. In the next video, we'll understand why we need logical addresses in addition to physical ones. Later, we'll start dealing with the IP protocol.